got some walk-up music. That was pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you, Corbin. I'm excited to be here. I have spoken here a couple times. I, I was here last year. Scott had invited me, and then he ended up going to Hawaii. And this year he's not here. I'm starting to feel like he will do anything to get out of hearing me speak. Um, I, I love Scott Peterson, and the look on his face in those pictures, he is just so full of light and hope, and of course he's going to recover well because he has that uh, spirit about him where he is just going to thrive. He sees the good in everything. So I'm excited to be here and to share this classroom with you. Yes, I call my son Nathan, but everyone else calls him Nate, like Corbin just did, just turned 22. And um, I have two, two college students, two kids here at BYU. So I'm excited to kind of be, be part of you today and share some of the things that I've learned. Uh, I was 25 when we started Utah Valley Magazine. Do we have any 25-year-olds, like exactly 25? A few of you, okay. So I was you, you were me uh, in the year 2000 when we started Utah Valley Magazine. And uh, back then, the term Silicon Slopes didn't exist, but along the way, that became a, a term that Josh James, who started Omniture and then Domo, coined. And along the way, that has grown, the community has grown, your job opportunities have grown, your list of potential speakers has grown. It's been an amazing, amazing time. And so I've compiled a few of the lessons that I've learned that I'd like to share with you today that hopefully will apply to you as people who are about to embark on your career. Some of you have already started, maybe you've already started a business or doing internships, but you have many more chapters to tell. And so hopefully something that I say today in stories about other entrepreneurs will be helpful for you. But first, a little bit about my story. I grew up in Idaho Falls as a very quiet girl, one of seven, daughter of a school teacher. We lived a really humble life. This was the only school picture my parents bought. There wasn't enough money to get school pictures every year, but in second grade, I lucked out. They bought my picture, and that's it. And then uh, in B when I was at BYU, uh, I made my way through school always having jobs, and I always tried to get them to relate to my interests, which involved journalism. I always loved hearing people's stories and then figuring out a way to share it. And so one of the things that I did to earn my way through school was to work at the Daily Universe. In fact, I was the editor of the universe, which is the best title I have had and ever will have. Uh, we printed it five days a week. It was a broadsheet paper. It was a lot of work, a lot of cool experiences. I got to experience um, kind of the glory. Some, I won some awards, but also some of the hard things when I got a few things wrong and upset some people. And when I, there were some controversial stories that ran, I had to deal with that. And I learned a ton from those experiences. I was always glad that I had to have a job because it forced me to get some experiences that made it so I was pretty marketable when I graduated and had multiple opportunities. Whereas some of the roommates that I had along the way that had their school paid for them and didn't have to work, I noticed that they didn't have as many experiences related to their future careers. And so even though it seemed like a hardship at times, it ended up being a huge blessing uh, to have to work and then to figure out how to apply that to my life. So along the way, I became a mom. This is not Nathan. This is actually Carson. Don't tell him his blanket is kind of pink. But uh, I have two boys and three girls. And the, one of the wonderful and challenging parts of my life has been combining my passion for journalism, my excitement about business, with my love for motherhood. As I was growing up as a teenager, I, I planned on both. Like I would go to young women and make the little cross stitch about my future family and you know, get excited about that. And then I would also do well in school and have big dreams that way. And it wasn't until I actually became a mom, when Nathan was born, that I felt like those two worlds collided and I didn't feel like anything had prepared me for what to do in that moment. Because all of a sudden it seemed like I might have to choose one or the other, but I didn't want to. I'm kind of this person with FOMO, which any of you guys all know that. I have it worse than any of my kids. I like all things, all things excite me. And so honestly, the answer to me trying to do as much as I could as a mom and as a business leader was entrepreneurism. It wasn't something I had considered until I became a mom. But when I suddenly realized that my desires were for flexibility and, and to create my own dreams and also to hold a baby if I wanted to while I was doing it, entrepreneurism was the answer for me. I had gotten a business minor when I was here at BYU, but I had only done it because I thought I would write for Inc. Magazine or Forbes. I didn't think I would actually start a business. But when I decided that that was going to be my path as a mom, then I was trying to remember all the things that I had learned in that accounting class and, and uh, organization behavior. All of the things all of a sudden mattered to me a lot more. So this picture, it's a little bit old now, but we're all cougars. My husband and I graduated from here. The oldest two on the far sides are students here now. And, um, and then I have two teenagers. And then this little one in the front, she's in second grade, little Lola. So it's a, it's a full life of kids and, and businesses. 
Along the way, the kids have helped as much as they could. Uh, Nathan, one of Nathan's jobs was the Bride Magazine Distribution Manager. <laughs> we gave him a real good title. And basically, we deliver Bride Magazines door to door, drop them on doorsteps or at housing complexes. Have any of you received the Utah Valley Bride? Have you seen it out in the wild? Okay. So that's, that's our publication. That's also our, our largest Instagram account, is Utah Valley Bride. Um, that one really connects, of course, with, with that age of, of content consumers. Uh, so this is my, my family. We are Cougars. Uh, Corbin mentioned the experience last summer. It was actually last year with Martha Stewart. She won the Lifetime Achievement Award. Mine was not that. But we both did give to, get to give back-to-back -back speeches at, there in New York. And it was one of those moments of just feeling like, wow, from that little girl in Idaho to going after this has been been exceptional, and uh, UVU has been good to me as well. They gave me an honorary doctorate in business earlier this year. So um, it's been a wonderful ride, and I owe it all to the things that I've learned from people that I've interviewed. Because when I go to do an interview, of course I'm looking for quotes for the story, but I also usually want to learn things that I can incorporate in my own life, in my own business. And so that's been a great experience for me, is to be a sponge. In fact, well, this is a vision board that I made that I was just going to show you that uh, if, if you don't believe in vision boards, and I kind of like wasn't so sure, but I made this a couple years ago, and I had put PhD on there. I don't know if you can read it kind of in the bottom there. And soon after that was when I got the honorary doctorate. I'm kind of, kind of crazy about that. Uh, Hiking Angels Landing, I ended up doing that too. But our very first magazine was in 2000. Uh, Thanksgiving Point was just opening. The gardens were just opening. I know you guys think they've always been there but they did have a, a birth, and it was about the same time that our magazine was coming to fruition as well. For that very first issue, I tried to call every famous person I could think of to see if they would want to be on the cover. Do you have any guesses on who I might have reached out to? The Osmonds, absolutely. Any other guesses? Larry Miller, I didn't reach out to him. That's a good idea. He lives in Salt Lake, and I always have this thing where I'm like trying to stay true to the Utah County market. So I did try the Osmonds, Robert Redford, who has still eluded me for 20 years, uh, Steve Young, um, and I've had Donnie now on the cover twice, and Marie once, and Meryl once, and, um, and Steve Young, but uh, not Robert Redford yet. But anyway, we had this uh, exciting first issue. When it first came out, it was honestly just so satisfying to, to smell that print and see that first issue. And now I can hardly look at this because it is not well designed. The Photoshop work on it is very subpar, uh, but at the time we were really proud of it, and that was my editor's pick. I was wearing white nylons, not, not a great choice. Uh, that was where we began, and now we've done, you know, next year will be our 20th year, and so we've done a lot of magazines, including Donnie. Do any of you follow the Bucket List family? Super fun. Garrett was actually on our business magazine as part of our sh uh, Shark Tank story a number of years ago, before he was married, actually. So. Um, so it's been fun, and our business magazine, we featured Travis Hansen, James Clark, probably a lot of people that you've heard in this class and others have been part of our magazine. We also do our bride magazine, like I mentioned, and uh, there's another cover of Business Q, the Q's for quarterly. We also do a lot of publishing for companies, so like BYU-Idaho, for example, your sister cousin to the north, they have us do their magazine for them. So people outsource things to us a lot as well. Um, okay, emotions. In that magazine I just showed you, our recent business queue, our UV50, where we named the top 50 businesses in Utah Valley, we asked entrepreneurs to share their most used emojis as they text. Okay, shout out to me, what are some of the common emojis you use? <laughs> Laughing, okay. Louder, somebody? Okay, drug, yep, I used that one today. Yeah, I was interested when we asked the most used emojis, I honestly thought that the list would be maybe short, there'd be five. But the range of emotions that entrepreneurs go through is wide, from crying to laughing to joy to prayer to, you know, this brown one down here at the bottom, the full range of emotions. And uh, it's been fun to experience that myself, but also to observe that in others. So, 10 lessons that I want to share from people I've interviewed that will hopefully help you as you plan your career. So the first is to seek diversity. So Ancestry was one of our uh, economic engines. We named top 10 top, top 10 <laughs> economic engines. Ancestry, of course, is on the list. This is a new CEO. She's actually a, a newcomer to our valley. She's from Silicon Valley and other places, worked at Google and things. 
And she talked about an effective leader being someone who champions diversity in the organization. Gender, race, diversity of thought. We need all of those experiences. Here's one of the challenges I feel like that you get at BYU. You have an amazing school, an amazing education, but diversity is a little more difficult. If you look at ethnicity, it's, there's a dominant ethnicity here, dominant religion, uh, a lot of Utahns. How many Utahns do we have here? If we had the time, we would see if these statistics match uh, the overall university statistics. 7% from Idaho, my home state. Uh, there are other things that are harder to quantify, though. Diversity isn't just those things. It's things that are a little more difficult and subjective. Extrovert, introvert is, is one. I consider myself an outgoing, ex an outgoing introvert. I actually really like being alone, and um, I'm a thinker, and I, and I do a lot of things introverts do, but I actually really like people as well. But those are some diversity components. Uh, people who love, that like to be in part of the logistics and behind the scenes versus someone who just wants to come in at the end and like, you know, be in front, okay? Those are other kinds of diversity. I would encourage you as you are completing your education here and as you go out into the world, seek diversity. It can be so common if a professor says form a group or maybe that happens in a church setting or whatever social setting to go to people who are exactly like you. That's the most common thing, that's the most comfortable thing probably, right? People who've had similar experiences, maybe look like you, maybe you'll be able to have that great small talk right from the start. But you will learn more if you get people around you who are different from you in all of these ways. Okay, there's lots of ways for people to be different from you, but you will learn more from them and they will learn from you. No one can be good at all skills, so you need to surround yourself with those type of people. Uh, one of the magazines that we do, Prosper, that Corbin mentioned, is for the network marketing space. And LifeVantage uh, is one of those companies here on the Wasatch Front. They were a sponsor of Real. We did this cover story, and the CEO right here, Doug Robinson, in my interview with him, he said something that had stuck with me. He said, if two of us have the same thought process, same ideas, same opinions, then one of us is unnecessary. Okay? And that kind, of, that kind of stuck with me, you know, as I've hired people. I've looked for people who are actually different from me. And it's not just all about who do you want to go to lunch with, but who could you learn from and who would round out your team. So seek diversity in your experiences. I encourage you to do that. Get out of your comfort zone and seek that in your life. Number two is to develop a growth mindset. One of our companies that has hit our UV50 list a number of times, which is hard to do because we, we look at their three-year growth percentage. So for a company to have a really awesome three-year growth percentage year after year after year, is really difficult. That means the growth curve has to always be significantly high from year to year. And so Goodwin Media is one that, that has impressed me as they've grown. They've done a lot. It's not just like they're designing ads, but they've designed uh, social campaigns, and they've been the engine behind a lot of the brands that you know and love around here, such as Chatbooks, such as Freshly Picked, uh, Fond Design, maybe some of the ones that you've heard of. And one of the things that they talk about is growth. So their team meeting starts every week with, what can we do to drive growth this week, okay? So that's a different mindset than what problems do we have to solve, okay? I would encourage you to also look at this in your own life. Like, what could you do to drive growth in yourself personally this week? You know, what could I do to get out of my comfort zone, experience something more? How many internships are you going to apply for this week? How many girls are you going to ask out? Whatever it is you need to grow in, I would challenge you to look at your week and say, what can I do to, to push for that growth? and this has been one of their keys to success. It's also important to know when it's okay not to have a growth mindset. And I've noticed in my business, I honestly do feel like if I had maybe never gotten married or never had kids, I feel like my business probably would be larger because I have had periods of time when it has not been my priority. It's been a choice to maintain or in some cases do away with some projects um, for, for motherhood. So sometimes you'll have those choices. Now this can be parenthood. I'm talking to the male and female students here where you for a time might prioritize other things other than growing your business. Uh, or you might wanna go on, on Survivor or Amazing Race or you wanna do American Idol, whatever it is, and you need to back off from your growth mentality over here. I think that's okay too, to see your chapters of life and know that some are for growth, I'm talking mostly career here, and, and some are not. And I think that's, that's okay, too. This is a picture of me the day all my kids were in school all day full time. I was kind of excited and kind of exhausted. Full soda. This is me landing inside my office. <laughs> my office manager took a picture. But I felt like I had gone, come to a finish line. 22 years 
of having a preschooler that either came to work with me or I have other arrangements and it was complicated, but this day all the kids were in school. Throughout your lives, you're gonna have periods of growth and periods where you're going to consciously choose to maintain and to focus on other things. And please know that that's okay. Now, in addition to that growth mindset, this is kind of like 2B of this point, okay? I want you to have an influence mindset as well. And this comes back to our shared beliefs. If those statistics hold true, 99% of you are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so follow with me here. So here's a chart that has being influential or being righteous, two descriptors that we probably both would like, you know, ideally. We would like to be high on both scales, right? Um, let's talk about where the Savior would be on this scale. On zero to 100, righteous, where would he be? 100, okay. Influential, I also think he would be 100, right? He's our ideal. And we're taught to be like the Savior. So if we want to be more like the Savior, it's actually not enough to just be righteous. You could stay in your King Henry apartment the rest of your life and memorize the standard works, and that would be righteous. But how much influence would you have? It would be low. And in that way, you would not be following the Savior that we're all trying to emulate. So becoming a person of influence is another thing to think about. Uh, not just what can I do to grow this week, but how can I have some influence for good on people this week? The church sets us up so well with their Light the World campaigns and their beautiful videos that we can be part of that. They make it easy for us to have some influence. Now, one more thought before I leave these charts. Okay, Satan, he's not righteous, but he is very influential. I shouldn't have put him at 100 because he doesn't have full you know, control of you, but he is an influential person. We want to follow the Savior and worry about both righteousness and influence. So your mindset on both of those things, I think, is essential as you leave here with the BYU education. I like this quote from Sherry Jew. If you don't think it's about you, he will multiply your influence. If you stay humble but willing, then... He will do great things with you. Okay, having a plan A. I feel like it's super important to have a plan in life because if you don't have a plan, how do you know if you're successful? How do you know if you're making progress? It's difficult. You need to have some accountability to yourself of what it is you're doing with your life. But also there will be times when your plan A doesn't quite work out, and that's going to be okay too. There's lessons in both of those things, but that doesn't get you out of the responsibility of making a plan, of having that plan A. Qualtrics, I'm sure Ryan Smith has been here or some of his uh, executives have been here. Uh, Qualtrics, so his initial plan, well, he's had a few plans that have changed. He was going to take the company public. That was like within days, okay? And um, he had picked his stock symbol. It was going to be XM instead of Q because he had by this time evolved into being experience management versus surveys. And then the offer came in. SAP wanted to offer him $8 billion, and he did what he should do and what any of us would do. You say yes. And you change your plan, and you don't go public with that. And that was within days. His plan changed. Also, his whole business model changed from when we first did a cover story on him, and it was about the surveys, which was very successful, but that evolved. That became a new plan. He was open to additional plans. Lindsay Sterling is someone who had... Her plan also evolved, but she also really kind of hung to this thing throughout her years as a BYU student studying rec management, uh, that she wanted to be a dancing violinist. Now, when she used to say dancing violinist, people would be like, never heard of it, sounds pretty difficult. Like, who would dance when they're playing the violin, right? But that was her thought, that was her goal, that was her plan A. And because she stuck to it and also had a very faithful approach, uh, she has been able to succeed. Many of her videos have millions, millions of views, more than Justin Timberlake, more than One Republic. They, I mean, her videos are a big, big deal. This is a long quote, and maybe you'd want to screenshot it and read it later, but basically she talks about how her partnership with God is what has helped her to succeed, and her promises to him, and the way he's promised back to help her, and that she feels like she and God have kept true to those promises, because she had her plan A, but she knew it could only work with him. Because to be a dancing violinist, not really like high likelihood of making a living with that, but uh, I, like, I liked her approach. It's interesting because I'm not owned by the church. The church doesn't own our magazines. They don't approve anything. They don't pay us. It's, there's no official relationship there. But because I write about a lot of members of the church, I hear a lot of these 
testimonies from people because it's part of their story. A lot of successful people see it as one and the same, and she was one of those. Studio C is another one where they had plan A, and then plan B, plan C, and they're on to plan, I don't know, plan G by now. But so many of them, Matt Meese worked at the Bean Museum. He graduated in philosophy, I believe, was working at the Bean Museum as a graduate, and kind of going along in life before this started. Jason was going to be a dentist. Uh, these people had different ideas and different plans. Then there was an, uh, an option to do a pilot of Studio C. They all decided to put their lives on hold for a second while that worked out. That's been a great ride. And now they're on to, do you know what their new venture is called? JK Studios. And so they're doing, Studio C still exists, but the original cast has moved on. And that's how life is going to go. And the people who succeed the best are ones who can have a plan and then move on to the next plan, take what they've learned along the way. Mindy Gledhill, another one who has evolved. I, I use this picture because this is one of my favorite pictures that we've ever taken, because I think her dress is so fun. This was taken at Valor on University Ave. How many of you have been to Valor? Okay, the first time you went, were you like, I've heard about this place and I thought it would be enormous, but it's actually as, just like as big as this stage. It's the tiniest little music place and it's so fun and so energetic. And that's where we took this photo. She started out as an LDS singer doing EFY type albums and uh, evolved. This was also one of our, my favorite cover shoots because we were jumping on the couch in the back of Valor. Fun to hang around Mindy. All right, we're four. Live in today's world. Today's world and contribute to it. And um, I think this is essential because your world is very different. I'm sure your parents have said this about a gajillion million times, that the world is different now. You know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't, you know, have all of these things. And that's, and that's the truth of it. But the key for you is to figure out what's happening in today's world and, and work with that. So Parachute, this is one of our winning companies that we just wrote about. And basically, they looked at the consumer economy. They looked at things like Uber, uh, DoorDash, uh, Airbnb this sharing economy where all of a sudden we're like totally cool with sleeping in strangers' beds and getting in cars with strangers. Now to those of us in our 40s, we're like, that sounds odd, but we've jumped on the bandwagon too. So they've done the same thing and their business is with camera equipment. They're exploring other verticals as well. But basically if someone wants to use some really nice camera equipment, thousands of dollars worth, but they only want it part of the year or whatever, there's a sharesies thing going on. That's parachute. So they looked at the world and said, okay, this is working with cars, this is working with hotels, Airbnb, Lyft, you see what I'm saying? And let's make it work for cameras. Okay, Award Co. This was our number one fastest growing company in the county this year. They just won that award from us last month. And basically, the idea is to help companies give their employees rewards. Now, do you know how easy it is to shop on Amazon? Like, it's so easy, one click, other places, so easy to, to shop. Well, they made this easy for employers when we want to give employees awards. And you can give them a certain number of points and then they go on to some free chosen items they can pick for their award for being employee of the month kind of a thing. So trophy by meaning like game tickets or restaurant tickets or some company swag. They figured this out. They figured out how to make it easy and how to draw employers into their circle and it's made them the fastest growing company in Utah County by just understanding the trends. Rachel Parcell, how many of you are some of the one million followers that Rachel Parcell has? I'm expecting a few girls' hands to go up. Okay, yes. Um, so Rachel Parcell is, uh, let's see, how old is she? She is 27, I think, something like that. I actually was just with her, we were both at this UVU event, and this is her dress, not her actual dress, but her, her holiday collection. And so anyway, I just was with her. She is someone who loved fashion and thought, okay, where are my people? Where are they? Her people are on Instagram looking for clothes. And one of the tips about identifying who your people are, and by this I mean this can be business, but can it, also, it can also be just being someone of influence, someone who wants to put out great memes or uplifting Sunday quotes or whatever it is, and to figure out who you're targeting and give them a name. So like Heather. You know, if she's targeting Heather, what would Heather want to wear to the company Christmas party? And then she designs fashions for that person. So she is one of these few examples I'm sharing that studied what's going on right now, what's big, social media, digital, other things, the sharing economy, these things that are new and evolving, that's where the opportunities lie in starting a new business. Okay, solving problems. So many of the great brands 
were started by people who were solving their own problem. Um, Taft, for example. Okay, Taft is high-end shoes. This is another Utah Valley company. This is Corey Stevens. Uh, he was the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year this year. It's a really big honor. And he used to like to wear boat shoes, but uh, he didn't like to wear them bare, barefoot because, you know, blisters and all that. So he would borrow his mom's no-show socks. Okay, but the problem was if he ever took his shoes off, people could see he was wearing his mom's no-show socks. So he first started by designing no-show socks for men. And that worked, and he developed a following online and uh, a database of people who were interested in men's footwear. And from there, he added high-end Taft shoes. So these are like a few hundred dollars to many hundreds of dollars of shoes that some high executives are wearing. And they just opened their first uh, retail storefront. They've mostly been online until now. He was solving his own problem of the no-show socks and then high-end shoes from there. I love that. Enso rings. Are any of you wearing an Enso ring today? It's like one of those silicone rings. We have, okay, I see a couple hands. Okay, what do you love about it? Perfect. Exactly. All right. So Enso rings are like men's wedding rings. That's what they look like, but they're made of silicone. So they're cheap and they're durable. The founders, one of them was um, rock climbing and his ring got caught. Okay. Now his fancy nice wedding ring. Now a few things can happen when that occurs. You can lose your finger. They have to cut off the ring, which actually happened to my husband once. Um, and they're, none of it's good. Like none of the outcomes of getting your ring stuck when you're rock climbing are good. So he thought, I want a nice ring that like, looks nicer than it is, but that I could do outdoor sports in. Because one of his options was not to wear a ring at all, which his wife didn't love that idea either. So he came up with this uh, cheap ring, silicone ring, that they are now doing millions of dollars of business with, with like $10 rings. Some of them are, are more than that. But the idea was durable rings that men can wear when they do athletics. And, and uh, you can have a few of them because it's so inexpensive if you want different styles and things like that. They were solving their own problem, which I love. Okay, number six, don't wait for perfect. Take action. This is one thing I've really had to learn because my natural personality is to straighten my paper clips and sit there and practice what I'm going to say on the phone and then sit there and practice some more and then read a business book and do all the things to get ready. Because taking action, that's, that's hard, okay, taking that leap. But I've learned that sometimes just jumping in is the best thing. And so sometimes I structure, I try to structure my day like that all the time, where I do the hardest things first, because it's so easy, A, to scroll social media, B, to look at my email, C, to talk to the people in the office, you know, D, to Marco Polo, whatever. Anything I can do to avoid work. But I've started to force myself to take action on the things that actually need to be taken action on, okay? I like this quote from Para, or Pattern, sorry, uh, another one of our local companies that's helping companies with their e-commerce strategy. And uh, I liked what they said, we have a bias for action. We don't know all the answers of ha or have all the data. They're very data driven, but even when they don't have it all, they take action today. So whatever it is in your life that is part of your goal, part of your plan A, figure out your action items. And one of the things that I think is a key to success is not setting yourself up for failure by thinking you're going to take more actions than you actually are. For example, if you tell yourself, I'm going to do 30, whatever the number is, 30 awesome actions today, and then you only do six, and you're like, well, I failed. I'm not even going to try tomorrow. That's setting yourself up for failure. So if maybe three action items. Maybe you'll, you'll adjust and find your right number. But take action today, even if you don't know everything. Uh, and I've learned to do that. So our business magazine, like I've mentioned the UV50 a few times, that was an idea in my head where I, I get a real thrill off of celebrating other people's successes. I just think it's awesome. And I also think that um, behavior that gets acknowledged gets repeated. And so I like the feeling of if I acknowledge people doing good things, both in growing revenue but also making the world a better place, that that will encourage them to keep going and it will encourage other people to also do those things. So uh, 12 years ago, we started the UV50 as a way to do that. Now, I was kind of doing my thing of like making it harder than it needed to be and saying, I'm going to wait another year to start that or whatever. And I finally was just like, no, I'm doing it this year. And at first it was going to be the UV100 and it ended up being the UV50, but I gave myself a pass on that. 100 is a lot of companies to interview and, and go over their revenue with. But um, it's been a lot of fun. Last year, 
or actually, let's see, two years ago now, was our 10th anniversary of the UV50. And I was having sort of a Hamilton obsession. Have any of you guys had a chapter of your life where you're obsessed with Hamilton? Hamilton, Broadway musical, he's on the $10 bill. And so in my mind, it totally made sense that our 10th anniversary issue should be Hamilton themed. And so that's what you see here. Um, but that was one of the times in my life where I stepped forward before I knew what I was doing. And I was scared out of my mind. And the day of the event, I was like, why am I doing this? Oh my gosh, I'm so stressed. And what do I wear? And the hair and all the, all the things and the dinner and the tickets. And, and then by the end of the night, when people were feeling acknowledged and, and loved and celebrated, and I realized that what I had intended to do had actually happened, it was such a thrill. And that all those details and the things that I didn't have right were okay. So that was my own example of that. This is one of my favorite scriptures from uh, the end of chapter 41 in Alma. And to me, this is like the LDS karma verse, okay? That which you do send out shall return unto you again and be restored. I feel like when we send out those intentions, when we send out um, love, kindness, when we send out, uh, when we help someone, when maybe they didn't deserve it, those things come back to us. It's, a, it's an eternal principle. And it's called lots of different things. There's a book called The Secret that is the same principle, basically. Karma, this law of restoration that's in Alma is very true. What you send out, if you send out criticism, whether in your mind or in your words, it will come back to you. And so we need to be careful what we send out in the, term, in the form of our actions because it does come back to us. So a little devotional there. All right, don't play the victim. Weaknesses might be your strength. This is another lesson I've learned because, like I mentioned, I grew up in a, um, I would say, lower class family. My dad was a school teacher, seven kids. The math on that wasn't great. There were some real estate things they had tried that hadn't gone well. And I carried that in my head a little bit like, well, other people have money. Other people's parents help them with college. Other people have more confidence. And I had kind of some victim talk going on in my head. And then, like I told you, I learned that having to work ended up being a huge blessing, huge strength to me. And that is often the case for other people as well. Thread Wallet, another cool brand. Anybody have a Thread Wallet or have heard of them? Okay. Yeah, I think they're targeting your age group, so I'm glad that you guys have heard of them. So it was a young couple that started Thread Wallets, living with parents, making Thread Wallets with a glue machine and thread and like really making them <laughs> with, with raw materials. And the, the, this is one of the quotes I love from their story we just did on them. The power of being broke drove us. It fueled us. So they didn't have money. They didn't have overnight success. But instead of playing the victim, they let it fuel them. And they've, they've developed a really great brand and a generosity. She was in our 40 Under 40 um, earlier this year. We always do a kind of a fun theme for our different issues. This one was music themed. So we asked everyone to share their career anthem. And running down a dream was hers from Tom Petty. She also came to the photo shoot uh, nine months pregnant. So hats off to her. I love that. I love that. She's really cool. Okay, be excellent. This is something I'm passionate about. And this is probably one of the conversations I've had the most often with some of the interns that I've had in my company. More women than men go into journalism. That was true as I was in journalism, and it's true now. Uh, and so I've had mostly female interns, and then we often hire those interns, and so I've had mostly female employees, at least in the content creation side of our business. And many of them start as single or newly engaged or maybe newly married. And then often, a couple years into it, they come, they want to talk with me, and I've had this conversation many times where they say, I'm going to have a baby, and I'm so excited but I don't know what to do about my work. I like what I do, but uh, I'd also like to be a mom and stay home, and I, they're grappling with it. And I enjoy having these conversations with them because I feel like I'm talking to myself in the past because it's such, it's such a thing to grapple with. Do we have any parents in here? You already have children. Okay, you understand what I'm saying. It changes your life. So when those employees come to me and I'll say to them, okay, tell me what would work for you. What do you want to do? Do you want to work from home? Do you want to just write one story a month? Do you want to take six months off and come back? And we kind of talk through their dream scenario. I will tell you, if they are excellent, I will 99% of the time grant their wish because they have become someone I don't want to live without. They're part of the team. I want to help them, and I know that they bring something to the team that I need. If they come to me and they've been kind of mediocre or maybe subpar, 
and they have these outlandish requests, I say no because it makes my life, it does make my life harder to accommodate this work from home, only work three mornings a week, take six months. Those things are harder. And so when they have been excellent, doors are open. This is not just a principle for women. This is for men and women. When you are excellent, your employers, your partners, whoever you're working with, will not be able to live without you, and you will have some flexibility for whatever you might need it for along the way. This is the picture that we took of my staff um, for one of our, I don't even remember what it was for, honestly. But we took this picture. This, this girl sitting next to me on the bench in the black, she's one who went through that scenario. Started as an intern. We hired her full time. She's been with me 15 years now. And she has four kids. And she's one of the ones, she's, she's our best writer. She's absolutely phenomenal. And my text conversations with her, I'm often screenshotting because they're so clever. Like, she makes me laugh. She's the wordplay master of all time. And, uh, and she's one that said, okay, I want to work from home, other than photo shoots and meetings and things that actually have to be done on site. Because I never want to lose her. I'm like, yes, whatever you say. Well, to this photo, she brought her kids. And if you look closely, maybe you can see them in the reflection in that, in that window. I didn't notice it. She's had her kids there quite a bit. I used to have my kids there a lot when they were little. And then when, when this almost was going in the magazine was the first time that I noticed that the kids were in the reflection because they'd come with her, with her for this photo shoot. And the art director was like, okay, no, I can wipe it out. We're good. I'm like, I actually want to leave it <laughs> because that's part of our company culture. And it just, it just shows that balancing act. And because of her excellence, this has been the flexible life that she is craving at this time. All right, be you, be the best version of you, but be you. Only, no one can be you but you. Don't fall into the trap of, well, I'm, I'm quiet and I wish I was outgoing like Bridger or like you know, somebody else that you're looking up to. Be you. One of the things we do with Business Q, uh, we do the 40 under 40. I showed you a slide a couple, couple slides ago of that. This particular one, we had everyone take the color code. How many of you have taken the color code personality test? A lot of you have, okay, yeah. It's pretty popular. How many reds do we have? Okay, yellows, uh, blues, and whites. Okay, those percentages were similar to what we found. Of the 40 that we had come in, red was number one, yellow was number two. Those are the top two colors for entrepreneurs. Kind of makes sense, because the reds tend to be strong personalities and leaders, and the yellows tend to be um, risk takers, they're looking for fun. They're, they're leaders, too, in their own way. Blues tend to be more emotional, connected, uh, kind. And whites are, are more amiable. Okay, So we had fewer whites. We only had three whites. And I was picking one for um, each color for the cover. So the whites had pretty good odds. There were only three of them. Um, but I, we loved studying their personalities and then, and then matching that to the businesses that they run. I think fun, knowing about your personality, here's Allison Faulkner, another Instagram famous person living here in Provo. She is totally herself, and uh, if you watch her, you will see. There is no one like her, including the tiger, the plastic tiger pants she wore to the photo shoot. She's a lot of fun. Personality assessments. There are many. This is just like a rudimentary list. I'm sure you have studied them in some of your classes. I think the more you know about yourself, the better, because... Don't try to change yourself, try to understand yourself. That's the most important thing. Because whoever you are is awesome, you just need to amplify the strengths that you already have and not try to be something that you're not. Not all of you are gonna be the next, um, who's the comedian you guys like? <laughs> who's like the cool comedian right now? Okay, Jim Gaffigan, good. I was thinking you'd probably pick someone younger, but you know, he's, he's good, he's like my age. Um, not all of you are going to be that, and not all of you are going to be Ryan Smith and start Qualtrics, and it's all good. You just need to be who you are. So I would be a student of your soul. Find out more about yourself. Along with that, be a very positive version of who you are. Positivity is probably the thing that I hear about the most. Probably the two, most, two things that I hear the most when I ask entrepreneurs their keys to success, they talk about positivity, like believing that it was going to work, and secondly, they talk about their team, being surrounded by people who help them. Uh, so I don't probably have time to go into both of these stories, but basically Hillary Weeks, who's a local singer-songwriter, she's built a few businesses related to music along the way. Uh, she started this, one of her businesses was clickers that you would use to count how many positive thoughts you had a day. 
more negative thoughts she had a day. She actually first started by counting her negative thoughts, and then she realized that the more she counted them, the more there were. So then she flipped it and started counting her positive thoughts and realized the more she focused on positivity, the more that grew. And she loved her life so much more when she was counting the positive. So there's that. This high schooler story, uh, every year we feature a high school student from every school in Utah County and name them the most likely to change the world. It's a very big title. It's also very vague but because there's lots of ways to change the world. But basically the idea is I want to showcase high schoolers doing awesome things and I want parents to read those who are raising kids because they give a lot of great parenting advice accidentally in their interviews about what they love, about what their parents have done, how their parents have encouraged them, or not in some cases. But one of the things that I love about these students is that there's a range. You know, some of them come in and they were like the basketball star and they're like, you're lucky to have me. And then other kids come in and they're nervous and they've brought their mom and their tuba and they're scared to death to do this magazine photo shoot. So there's a range. But when I ask them what they love about their high school, they all answer it pretty much the same way by saying, they, they light up, first of all, that's like the most confident I see them all. And then they start saying, I go to the best high school. We don't have cliques. The teachers really care about the students. It's just this awesome, it's just like a family feel at my school. Well, statistically speaking, the schools in Utah County are not all the same. They're not all the best, statistically speaking. But these students see their school as the best. They're not looking over their shoulder going, well, I wish I was going to Timpview. I wish I was going to AF. They don't. They look at their school and go, I'm at the best school in the whole wide world. And that's why they're going to change the world, is that positivity. So you need to feel that way, too, that you're at the best school. You have the best roommates. You pick the best major. You've got the best set of, you got the best hair ever. <laughs> Whatever it is, tell yourself you do have the best. All right. I think we are about out of time, so I'm going to kind of um, burn through this. One, we have time for one last thought? Are we good? Okay. All right, so you're here to learn the rules of business, right? You're here to learn what has worked. You're here to learn some sound principles, but you're also, gonna, you're also learning to learn so that you can go out and do things a little bit your own way, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, one of the interviews that I did last year, it's this, or this same issue, I guess it was two years ago now, Josh James and Andrew Smith, two of the tycoons of Utah Valley. For the photo shoot, I said to them, we had a Rubik's Cube theme at this particular one, and I said, okay, I'm going to hand you both a, a, a brand new Rubik's Cube. I want you to mess it up, hand it to each other, and then the first person to fix it, you know, is the winner kind of a thing, okay? I did a video, but it's, we're not going to have time for it. Basically, Josh took it apart. That didn't work because he was looking for a new way. He wanted to be the fastest, but he was trying to do it a different way. He broke it, and he was going to plug it back in. When that didn't work, he saw that I had an unopened brand new Rubik's Cube over in my stuff, and he grabbed that and came back on with it. And, you know, Andrew, it's probably meant to be, we don't have time for the video because there was a swear word in there. But um, Josh won because he saw it differently. He didn't assume the rules. He just looked at what needs to be done and how can I get there. And that is, an, that is a way that you have to think to succeed in business. So we'll bypass that video. Thank you for spending some time with me. I am excited. Thank you. I'm excited to watch your journeys, and I hope I get to interview and write about many of you in the future, because I think you have some great, great chapters and some great years ahead of you. So thank you for being here today. Thank you.